Tom Hagen has been a member of Sarah since 2010 and is a retired electrical engineer having worked in the area of automotive electromagnetic compatibility. Tom likes to promote amateur radio astronomy by trotting out his hydrogen horn of plenty radio telescope at Detroit area star parties, and he teaches programming classes at his local public library. Tom lives with his wife, Kathy, and cat Anna in Rochester, Michigan. So go ahead, Tom. Well, thanks, Rich, for the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, opportunity to speak. It. Okay. Um, all right, so everybody can hear me. Um, yeah, my uh, ongoing project here for that I've been working on, I guess, for like two years now. I've, I've done, I think this is my third, second or third. Uh, Sarah presentation is a web, a uh, little web application that I'm working on to uh, examine archived data from the uh, LOFASM uh, radio telescope system. LOFASM is, uh, stands for Low Frequency All Sky Monitor. And uh, it's a, um, uses the, um, the dual, the, you know, the common dual dipole uh, array, uh, antenna array that, that's used in long wavelength array and other, other setups. It's uh, a uh, very simple, inexpensive instrument that small institutions, even um, um, individuals could probably put one of these together for maybe $50,000 or so. So uh, um, anyway, um, I've become a acquainted with uh, some of the people that are involved with it, especially uh, Professor Tim Dolch. He's a professor at Hillsdale College here in Michigan, where I live. Um, he has an array there at, down by Hillsdale. And I've also, I'm collaborating with uh, Louis Dartes, who's from the uh, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, who developed the system as part of a, a master degree project. This was developed uh, by uh, UTRGV, and uh, it's really a nice system. It's small, it's it's um, affordable, cheap. I um, um, was interested in, in the last presentation about uh, all the cost saving measures that have been done, and the um, the preamplifier, eleven degree Kelvin noise figure, is just outstanding um, with uh, uncooled parts. That's um, I'm. Kind of curious, will those uh, preamps become available for uh, <laughs> us at some time? I would, they don't look like they'd be that expensive. Uh, well, there, there will be a paper about them. The, the, the transistor is not cheap. It, it's, uh, it's about $100. Okay. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the whole thing probably could be made for $300 or so. For that quality, I mean, that's, you know, I think that sounds like a, you know, maybe you can do it, do it make some money as a sideline. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so anyway, uh, this uh, interface is intended to be a citizen science project. I want to use it to get students interested in uh, science, mathematics, uh, technology, etc., cetera, um, and also to promote um, local um, amateur astronomy efforts here in the Detroit area, and of course, easily go worldwide. So uh, here's my uh, presentation outline. I'll talk a little bit about LOFASM again, to refresh everybody's memory and for people that are not familiar with it. Um, I'll spend a few minutes about citizen science efforts. Again, I, I was gratified to hear about all the citizen science efforts ongoing uh, in the presentations I uh, sat through today. Those are very encouraging and interesting projects. Um, so a little bit of the technical uh, portion of the uh, interface will be covered. I'm using uh, 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 software called Dash Plotly. I'm using uh, Docker as a uh, a uh, virtual machine, I guess virtual machine application on my uh, Raspberry Pi where I'm developing all this stuff. I'll talk a bit a little about the databases and how we're going to try to manage the thing and so on and so forth, the state of the art um, demo and so on. So uh, anyway, LOFASM is stands for uh, Low Frequency All Sky Monitor, designed by the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, and it operates in the 10 to 88 megahertz range. 
It's uh, simple enough for smaller institutions to build stations and education is uh, an important component of the mission. It was almost baked in uh, the mission. It assembled by the first stations were assembled by students down in Texas there. Currently there are four stations in operation. There was a station at the uh, end of the north leg of the VLA down in Socorro, but I guess those uh, 12 uh, antennas have been transferred to the long wave array program, uh, being that they use all the same you know, hardware, that it's natural fit. There's, my understanding, there's one running at uh, Goldstone out in California and Green Bank. West Virginia, I hope to uh, see it next year when we have our conference again there. And the fifth station is the uh, Hillsdale Station here in Michigan. So here are the um, familiar antennas that uh, comprise the, uh, the system. And uh, this is the Hillsdale uh, station. Uh, they're arranged in the Star of David configuration, as you can see in the uh, Aerial shot there, 12 cross dipoles, uh, standard uh, uh, LNA and everything. And there's a, then in the middle here, there's a junction box where the signals come together. Um, the, uh, there are uh, 12 signals. We have, we have, first we have an inner loop here of six antennas, and then we have the outer loop of six antennas. So that's 12 antennas. Then we have east and east, west, and north, south um, dipoles. So uh, when you put all that together, you have um, 10 correlations, I believe. Memory's a little fuzzy on this. We have uh, Four auto correlations: uh, inner east-west, inner north-south, outer east-west, outer north-south. So those are the four auto correlations. Then you have uh, all the other possible combinations. So that gives you another six. So there's there are ten correlations that uh, come out of the system. Um, there's also a uh, 13th antenna that's used for calibrations, another thousand feet or so away. The uh, equipment shack is a, is uh, about a thousand feet from the array. The cables run underground from the junction box here in the middle, where power and is supplied, and then the signals are returned back from the uh, different arrangements. So uh, anyway, um, so the station looks like this. We have uh, we have the on the left here. We have the twelve antennas. We have. Uh, Processing is done out at the shack at the low phasm station. It uses a roach board and um, it uh, process, does all the processing there. There's a GPS receiver for uh, time stamping and things like that. Um, so, uh, and then the data is taken in five minute uh, runs. So we have, uh, and correlations, uh, five minutes apiece, and you work work out the arithmetic. If it's running 24/7, you have 288 files per day. Um, comes out to a total of about 28.8 gigabytes of data per day that go that aren't updated real time because this thing is uh, does not have a you know high speed data connection. So. Typically, uh, you have to go out and grab a, a hard drive, solid state drive, whatever, and then take it in into the office and upload it. Right now, um, Professor Dolch at Hillsdale is, has a very high capacity Google Drive where these files are going. And then I can access that for uh, developing here at home and uh, or working on my, um, my uh, application here. So. That's what I'm doing, getting the files from uh, Professor Dolch and developing my, my interface here. Okay, 
So um, here is a waterfall plot of uh, an anomaly. It's from the looks of it, it's probably a man-made signal. We have um, the carrier here, and then maybe information off from the side bands, and we're getting, you know, inter intermittent um, receipt of the signal here. It's probably maybe a tropospheric signal from uh, a transmitter. Could be. Uh, a TV transmitter. This sort of looks like the uh, di digital signature. Um, there are still in, uh, some low band VHF TV stations in the country. Most of them are, are low power, but there are a few high power stations in the country here. So uh, it's a possible source of the interference. And uh, who knows, maybe we could use these things as beacons to uh, study ionospheric propagation or something. I don't know. Um, so that's what an anomaly could look like. Um, I, nobody, to my knowledge, has really gone through uh, these files on a you know on a large uh, um, large scale basis. So in talking with uh, you know the people at Lofas, and they you know I, I offered to do this, and they welcomed it as a chance to uh, maybe get the data out there and get people, presumably students, looking at it. So the task now is to figure out a way to, uh, for me to get the data and process it somehow or another such that it, I can create images like this and then people will go online and uh, go through the uh, individual files. We'll have probably several hundred files in a, in a batch at a time that maybe one day, I don't know. I haven't uh, worked all that out yet, but uh, people go in and maybe uh, say, go in and, and mark, oops, mark areas of interest here. So- uh, uh, At 50 megahertz, I just wonder if that's a meteor re reflection. Well, it's, could be, very well could be, yeah. Um, you know, over 20 seconds or something like that. And uh, yeah, there could yeah. be a chain of them coming in or something. That could be, uh, yeah, is that right? And right. you've seen, okay, yeah. But that is some kind of a man-made signal, you would agree, right? That's, what it looks like to me. I don't have enough information. Okay. <laughs> well, all right. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, we have a pretty, uh, pretty uh, storied history of citizen science efforts where uh, amateur astronomers have been assisting professional astronomers. Again, I was gratified to hear about the, uh, you know, the uh, radio camera possibility for uh, Groups like us, individuals like us, to get involved, and that could be, uh, you know, a real, a real um, game changer for um, professional amateur collaboration. Um, the uh, oldest astronomical group that I'm aware of is the American Association of Variable Star Observers. The AAVSO is uh, was founded in 1911, and uh, basically people just uh, uh, look at uh, um, selected variable stars to uh, engage their magnitude. This is something that people have done for years and years, just manually by eye. And, and uh, I guess pretty good observers can determine uh, stellar magnitudes down to about a tenth of a magnitude accuracy. So that's been going on. And now AAVSO is, of course, the... Uh, Obser observers are moving into photometry technology and things like that. So uh, that's coming along too. It's uh, still a very viable active organization. Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers is, was another organization founded in the 1940s, I believe. Uh, in CERA, of course, we have the CERA sections that Steve Jickus is working on and has done a yeoman's effort on. Um, now there's one that probably most of us have heard of. It's called Galaxy Zoo. This is um, a project, one of many projects on um, an organization called Zooniverse.org. So uh, I was, I'd like to just switch over to uh, my browser and take a look at, uh, at Zooniverse, show you what's out there. And there's some interesting things. Um, it looks like, yeah, here we go. I did 
not lose it. Um, so here, here is uh, zooniverse.org. And uh, I've gone to um, uh, the project section and, and well, let me, yeah. You can see some of the projects that this people are working on. There's projects in the arts, group, biology, climate, history, language, literature, medicine, nature, social science, physics, and of course, space. So if you select the uh, space tab here, we have 24 different projects running in Zooniverse that are related to space. And uh, there's there have been radio astronomy projects here also. Um, cloud spotting on Mars, Jovian, Vortex Hunters, Rosetta Zoo, uh, Watch Comet, Watch a Comet, Look for Changes, Solar Jets, Dark Energy Explorers. Um, and then Galaxy Zoo is uh, one that's, that's probably one of the most famous ones in this section. So what they do here in Galaxy Zoo is they provide you with uh, graphics. These are you know, JPEGs or PNG files. And then you uh, people go in and they they look at the you know the picture here and they try to find anomalies or new structures. Anyway, just to give an idea of the scale here, this one has eighty seven thousand plus volunteers. It's done nearly five million classifications of three hundred twenty thousand subjects, so on and so forth. So uh, this is the kind of thing that I'm you know I'd like to do here with this and. Uh, there is, there was a radio uh, astronomy project related to um, the CHIME telescope up in uh, British Columbia. I forget what it stand, stands for, but it's a 700 to 1500 megahertz telescope. And they, they, they had uh, a project going, but it, it uh, wound down. Uh, Gravity Spy, help scientists at LIGO, and then there's this radio meteor zoo that um, um, gives people pictures that look like this uh, from, you know, radio uh, signatures from meteorites. Uh, this project is in, headquartered in Belgium. They have a 49.9 uh, a, uh, megahertz, megahertz beacon uh, that basically it, it's pointed straight into the sky at 130 watts, and then uh, people in probably mostly Europe, I guess, would, would look for reflections. So uh, there's some radio astronomy uh, activity going on here in the, um, the online search view. Okay, here, let's see, back to the presentation. So uh, that was uh, a little bit about Zooniverse. Uh, Continuing, um, yeah, um, I, uh, Louis D'Artes, um, who by the way is uh, just recently completed his doctorate degree at the University of Texas, and uh, he's now doing a postdoc uh, um, uh, assignment at LIGO, the Long, Long Interferometry Gravity Observatory in, uh, out in Hanford, Washington. So um, that's that was pretty pretty neat for him. Um, so uh, I'm using uh, a Linux, I mean a Python uh, application. It's a Python library called Dash, and it's uh, created by this company in Montreal named Plotly. Um, basically, Dash allows you to do uh, very high level uh, data analytics and visualization tools using Python. The beauty of it is they do most of the heavy lifting for you with, um, you know, they can access these, these functions through uh, the Dash Python library. So you write your script in Python. The one I've, I've got so far is only about a hundred lines of Python. And uh, it does some really fun stuff with the, uh, the binary dial. Uh, binary data files that I've been getting from a uh, low FASM system. Um, so uh, yeah, Dash is built on top of, of Flask and uh, JavaScript. And when I started this project, I was looking at using 
Flask and, and JavaScript and so on. And uh, Lewis pointed me to this, and I thought, wow, this, this just cut my work by at least 90%. So uh, we'll take a look at some of the fun things that you can do with Dash. Um, we'll go to the Dash website for some demos here. <clears throat> So uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, yeah, I found uh, this is an example of um, of what you can do with with Dash. Well, something you can do with Dash. I found this one. This is uh, basically um, a map of Europe that shows what happened to it. Um, you can, it, it accesses a database and creates this map of Europe. And the database uh, is uh, about food consumption here. Here's the one I was looking for. Food consumption in the various countries of Europe. And I found some interesting facts. Um, so anyway, uh, basically this one accesses a database consumption by food type in uh, the European Union. So we we see all these countries that are color coded and um, you can select a food category. The first one that comes up is alcoholic beverages. So you can see the scale over here is in kilograms per capita per in, in individual countries. So the yellow country here, for example, is the highest. Chechia, Chechia for example, has a per capita annual alcoholic beverage consumption of 171 kilograms. <laughs> Anybody find that strange? Greece, for example, is the lowest at a mere 43 kilograms per, per year per person. But um, So you can select different um again this is this is uh very easy to set up using using these uh these tools so i was really glad to find out about this um so let's see here back to the presentation and um that was flatly dash and then uh this is the um, the file viewer that I've been working on, and um, this is what it looks like. We have um, we have a um, uh, this is a vertical scales our time scale. This should be in zero to five minutes. I don't have this thing scaled properly. Then the uh, x axis is our frequency range, and I don't even know what what this range is here it might be zero to 100 megahertz. Again, I uh, this is a work in progress. And uh, I'm uh, running this on my Raspberry Pi here on my network. So uh, back to the browser. And then I'm gonna look at, this is the, um, this is what the file looks like uh, that's served up uh, on my Raspberry Pi, my little Raspberry Pi server that's running Dash Plotly, the, um, the um, Python script that basically it goes out, grabs the data, creates the display, and then it serves it you know, over uh, HTTP port over my network. So uh, here we have, um, this is the file here. This is the uh, what's called the BBX file. It's the binary data file for uh, five minutes run. And the date here is coded in and the time, the start time is coded in here in the EPC. So, and the uh, correlation I'm looking at, this is the uh, auto correlation for the, the, uh, the D, um, whatever you call it, uh, configuration that it would be like east, west, outer loop or something like that or whatever, whatever, I don't recall. But anyway, this is just one of the 10 correlations that come out. So uh, 
the user will uh, log into the system and will get a plot. And uh, if the user hasn't logged in on the uh, the batch, the you know the present batch, he will he will get the first file. And if he let's say he you know we have 200 files in the batch, he goes through 50 and then logs out. And next time he logs in, he will get uh, you know uh, correlation number 51. So. Uh, nifty thing here is uh, you can uh, <clears throat> you can zoom in and out uh, let's say we want to zoom in on let's see this section here this lets you do it and uh, we're looking at you know we're again we're looking at actual data this is not a you know a jpeg or a png a graphic image so let's say we wanted to zoom in on this section here we thought that hmm, maybe this is something interesting that we want to flag we um, we can draw a little box around it, and um, so basically the box is um, x uh, x zero x one and <clears throat> excuse me y zero and y one that mark out the corners. So the um, Python creates a dictionary down here that is. Um, set up inside of a Python list, which is done by the brackets here. So here is our first anomaly. Let's, uh, let's say we want to go back to full view. We can say, oh, here's, here's another one over here. Here's another one over here, another one over there, and so on. And this, this thing just uh, builds and creates the, uh, you know, identifies the coordinates for uh, all the anomalies that, that people could possibly identify. Now, um, this part, um, these buttons will be used for saving your anomalies or uh, telling the system that you found no anomalies for a particular plot. So if I click the save anomalies, uh, this anomaly list will get parsed out and, <clears throat> and uh, saved in a, in a database um, online. So uh, that part is not working yet. That's um, in progress. I hope to finish it by the end of August because uh, Professor Dolch has students coming back and wants to try this out on. So he wants to get its students at his day looking at his data. So that's uh, a uh, bit of a motivation for me. Back here to the viewer. Um, Let's see, um, the other thing I'm doing is in addition to dash plotly, I'm running this thing in a um, virtual container inside uh, of the Docker virtual operating software platform. Docker is another thing that um, uh, Louis D'Artes told me about. And it's, this is, uh, this is a, a really amazing thing too that I had no idea existed. Um, Docker as something that you set up, you can set it up on uh, Apple, or Linux, or a Windows machine and run what's called a Docker container that uh, in my case, uh, basically is an Ubuntu environment. And uh, earlier, uh, I think it was last presentation, people were talking about developing and using uh, virtual uh, machines and so on. I, I've tried both, and this one seems to me a lot smoother and faster and simpler to use than uh, some of the uh, virtual machines I've used. Don't know if anybody's used Docker before, but um, looking at her, oh, it was the um, gentleman from Colorado discussing um, how to set up the various uh, programs, the Tempo and the, the other one uh, that he was using. Um, it might be a possibility. I don't know. I, I'm curious to see if anybody else has used this and what experience they've had with it. Anyway, um, I'm developing my app on a 4G Raspberry Pi 4. The uh, Pi 4 is running Raspberry Pi operating system. And then I install the Docker software on the, uh, on the Pi. Then I create a container for my uh, BBX viewer project here. And then that 
uh, container actually is running as as an Ubuntu um, on an Ubuntu uh, operating system. So well, I can develop it on the Raspberry Pi, this container, and then I can take the container and just pick it up and drop it onto another machine that's running Docker and uh, everything works. There's no, no problems. Uh, so this, this makes uh, developing a lot, lot easier for me. I'm, you know, I'm not a professional. I haven't been a professional. You know, that's sort of a hobby for me. And uh, this is, uh, once you get through the learning curves on all this stuff, it's, it's, it's pretty neat what you can do. So yeah, eventually it might, you know, it might be possibly running this on a web service that would run the app on a production scale. The uh, scheme looks something like this. Um, I have my um, Lofasm tools, Docker container. I call it Lofasm tools, uh, Docker container that uh, runs the um, Python script that uh, creates the, the BBX file viewer and then serves it out over the, uh, on my uh, local network here over an HTTP port. Uh, then the Lofasm tools runs on top of Docker, which presents to me uh, the Ubuntu operating system. The uh, Docker itself runs on the uh, Raspberry Pi operating system, which is the host operating system. The, uh, the, the thing you have to do is you do need to, if you're downloading files, for example, um, from um, Google Drive, you I've been doing it from the Raspberry Post, I, Raspberry Pi OS uh, window. It's easier for me to work in a window. So you have to share a volume between the Raspberry Pi operating system and the Docker container uh, uh, structure. So. Basically, in, when you start the container, you have to run this command here, um, basically that connects the, uh, the Raspberry Pi directory where your data is to the directory where the uh, Lofasm tools container expects it to be. Then of course it runs on Pi 4, which connects to the internet. And um, to manage this whole thing, we'll have the administrator will probably access the uh, uh, virtual VNC, that's the uh, virtual uh, uh, tool that you use to connect your Pi over the network. And then the web users will just access uh, via HTTP and just look at the files and get the, uh, you know, save the data and so on. A um, little bit about the databases. We're planning uh, one database with two or three data tables. I'm just learning this. I'm using uh, SQLite 3, which is a pretty easy uh, database to set up and run. It's got a, uh, Python libraries or um, default with Python 3 to uh, access SQLite. Um, let's see. Database will be written to. That's, that's where I am right now. I'm trying to get all this stuff working so that when you push a button, it actually does something. So, uh, oh, I don't know, one of the databases will have usernames and passwords, the last file rated, uh, that user rated, so that if they come in and they do two files, and uh, then when they log in again, we'll start with the next one. We don't want people going through the same files over and over and over and mess around with it. We want, to, want people to just go through it once, give it their best guess, and then we'll, we'll take a look what everybody's doing. Um, another data table will be the list of our files. I, right now I'm just testing with these four files and put in some phony baloney information here just for demonstration purposes. The third table will be the anomalies that are found. So um, here's a file. It has um, each anomaly will have a start time and end time, a start frequency and an end frequency and the username who uh, who uh, found the, the anomalies. Um, the administrator, yeah, we'll need to uh, manage this. We haven't uh, figured it all out yet well, how we're going to do it, but somehow or another we'll, you know, we'll, we'll start start this fall, I think, using it with, um, over the um, 
probably a VPN, private VPN setup. So we'll just have limited access to it until we get the you know the bugs worked out. And then we can um, turn it turn it loose in the wild. I don't know. This is um, just basically. Um, I don't think it's that important to describe to you, but we do we do need to figure out the process of how we're going to manage the data. You know, who logs in, how we're going to control it this and that and the other thing and so forth. So, okay, next steps. Um, I'm working on the databases that will store the data that the people uh, store the anomalies that people find. Um, create user login portion. Well, that's probably not too necessary yet. We'll test over private VPN, promote users. Um, maybe at some point, We'll move it over to a web services platform, publicize the project, and get students in the public involved in another citizen science project. So, summary um, talk a little bit about the low FASM system, background history, citizen science projects, rationale for creating this application, uh, given partially functioning applications running on my Raspberry Pi at home, and I gave a little demo here, and a little bit about how we're going to manage it. Any questions? Thank you. A comment from uh, Chuck Higgins uh, about uh, look into using Autoplot. He's got a, uh, a link there to autoplot.org. Okay. Uh, Walt uh, says, looks like TV channel two with carrier frequency 55.75, that meteor scatter potential. Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, it's also, there's an old TV channel at uh, 56 to 62 megahertz. Mm -hmm. It's possible. And uh, Stephanie says, uh, Docker is great. Love it. Good. And uh, okay. Any other questions for uh, Tom? I think this has, uh, I mean, looking at some of the stuff that uh, Sandy's going to do with all that data, this might be a citizen science uh, project like this to analyze their data might be very useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, okay. uh, if if this thing works out, I you know I I, I could take on other projects or not. <laughs> you know?